Hello, YouTube artists. Welcome back to In the Studio with me. I'm so happy to have you here. Today I want to show you a different way of how I'm doing practice. One of my goals this year is to practice layers. I could do layers in acrylics because you can always add the lights on top of darks, but when doing watercolor you always have to keep the light value in your mind. <laughs> so I had grabbed a couple things and I put together a little bit of layout so that I could practice. And I did, this took me two weeks to do, was over two week time. And I just painted a little every day because I have to really think about layers still. Think about what goes on top, how I'm gonna shade that, what kind of things I'm going to use. So this was a matchbox cover, a little word card, and then a lead holder. And I was just trying to get the layers on there. And you can see that it took a while to understand how I was going to do it. You know, I want to add my splashes. I want to add texture. I want to add some granulating paints, like this is hematite violet genuine there. And I want to add shadows because I think shadows is really what gives the def definition of layers for me. So I did that one. This again was just two little color cards. Think of like paint chips from the store and another lead container. I really like the depth of the velvet here and I'm practicing letters as well. Not always the easiest things. I like to create tags in a lot of my stuff because I just think anything can go on a tag. And I had a tag, this is just like a coin envelope and then another thing for leads, pin tips. And then this was three coin envelopes and then a word card and then again a pencil lead you can see a theme here <laughs> this one is probably my favorite out of the group just because I like the richness of the colors and you can see my splashes and yet I'm getting better at writing a little bit more I'm taking my time and then this was the last one where I wanted to really just try to get the round shapes round <laughs> it's not always easy but by adding shadows on the sides here, on both sides, it gives it a little rounder shape. And I had this one balancing on top of that and I like the shadow underneath here. And you can see my writing's getting a little better. And I love the shadow here under this little raffia tie. Just little things just make me so happy with that. <laughs> I also want to show you a different kind of practice, and that is looking for inspiration in your magazines and books, whatever you have laying around. Because yes, I can create my own, but sometimes I just want to find something that I'm inspired by and just sit and paint it. So when I was looking through magazines, I save a lot of magazines and I save them for different reasons. I usually save them for different textures. I am usually drawn to color, but textures is probably the main thing. And as you go through with me, you'll notice how many textures are in here. So I just rip out the pages and then I put them in a little manila envelope here or a file folder. And you can see the texture here. And then here's more texture. But I loved the simplicity of this. I love that it was just a rectangle with a hole and half the hole was missing. I was just like, I can paint something like that. <laughs> I love this picture. I liked it because of the wires crossing over everything. That's the only reason I cut this beautiful piece of art out was for those wires because I was like, that is great, a great practice to practice shadows, highlights, and trying to create something on a top layer. If you'll notice the heart is in there, then this piece, then the wire is all on top of that. I love pages like this where it's their detail pages, I think is what Somerset Studios calls them. But look at all the different textures in there. So each one of these will become a little study for me because I'm interested in how do I create this texture in watercolor? How do I create the fringe in watercolor? Because right now I don't have the answer, so I would have to sit and play with that. Look at this little doily here, like a part of a crochet doily. I just really like that. I love the texture here. And you can see they're all inspiring. Here's another one. Look at that beautiful stamp. <laughs> so I just have photo after photo. 
of little details that I was charmed by their style, by their fabrics, by their stitching, by their marks. It was just all kinds of different things on why I picked this. This one I loved because of the wire and the white background. I just thought that was so neat. So you can see it just is page after page after page of different textures. I love the simplicity of just a single key. I love the different layers of this, especially if it has rust in it. I'm all about it. <laughs> Look at the complicated scene of this. Uh, this will take me a while <laughs> before I have the guts to do it. Because you see there's lace and there's burlap and there's a pen and there's yarn and there's a zipper and there's twigs and there's just all kinds of juicy details in there. I've got to work up to this one. <laughs> and so on and so on. So if you are interested in layers, I would definitely start a folder for yourself and just start collecting anything you see. I mean, magazines, newspapers, flyers. I'm always looking at like free magazines when I go into a shop, you know, if it's something in a new area because you find the most glorious pictures sometimes. Think of rugs and tassels. It depends on what you're wanting to study. You know, I like texture and I like usually things that are hanging over other things. So think of a piece of thread, or like I said, this little bit of raffia here. To me, that is just nice because it gives you a place to play with shadows, and I like that. So let me show you a couple of them that I've done lately. The first one I ventured into was this one. And this, it was really because of this shape here and the dirty tape. <laughs> I know it's like the weirdest thing of what I'm drawn to but I did that in my last um, sketchbook with you and I shared the page here now this is my interpretation of it so this was the design here that I really loved I love the circle I love that half of it was plain and half of it was painted I really like that and I like that they it looks like they wrote here I found some book page type that I just cut apart and I really liked it. It makes no sense. It says iceberg within my embrace, but the coolness of this color, which is Davies gray and some of this in here reminded me of winter. So I just thought that, that was really kind of cool. And so this was my rendition of this. Yes, I took the idea, but I kind of did my own thing. Yes, I'm trying to figure it out, but I'm taking what I really like here and I'm trying to do it here so that I have a reference of it. And then I'm also writing if it's if I have the name of what who did it. I'm writing inspired by like here it says inspired by Lynn Moncrief Art Journaling Winter 23. I like to put that in my sketchbook so that I remember that I use someone else's reference. In my new sketchbook, this sketchbook, I really want it to be about layers. I really just want the whole thing to be about me trying to figure out layers and how I can get them created and how I can put them so that they look like they're stacked and they have shadows and everything fun like that. So this piece here is what I did in this book. You remember my sketchbook that we did together? And then here is my piece. So I liked the four, I like the heart, I like this paper in the background, and I kind of like this green color down here. I just thought that was kind of nice. But again, what I really liked was the wire going across, and how could I do that? So when I'm breaking it down for myself, I'm like, okay, what layer has to go first? For me, how I did that was I did this dark layer first, because I knew everything else kind of sits up on it. So I went around the square, I went around the wire, but I painted the actual heart first because I knew I wanted to get darkness, I wanted it to look rusty, and then everything else kind of followed suit as far as what color I was using where. And then I did the four, and then I did the background, this black background. That took me a little while because I wanted to figure out how to do the scratches. Let's bring you up so you can see. Look at all those scratches there along the edges, 
And how was I going to do that? So I tried with a wax resist crayon and that gave me quite a nice little area. But then I came back to and just actually scratched it with like some scissors to just give a little bit more depth in there. And trying to figure out this little piece here. <laughs> I love the text on here and I like the color, but I could tell that it was collaged on so that it's got different texture and then the ink was dropped on. I know enough about collage that I could figure out what they did there. So then I'm like, well, how do I do that? So what I did was create one giant color first. I used French gray, American Journey French gray as the background. And then I just, when it was wet, I dropped some of the brown in there. I used the same brown that I used here so that they would kind of coordinate. And then because I like the green down here, I just decided to add a little texture of Davies Gray. I knew I didn't want to create a shape around it, you know, like a rectangle or something, because I really wanted you to notice the heart. For me, that was a really big thing. So by just giving it a little bit here and a little bit here, it kind of adds to the story as far as I'm concerned. And I like that a lot. So what I'm doing in this book is... I'm doing one here, just like I did the Shirley Trevana book study. I'm taking what I learned here, and then I'm going to do my own piece on this page. And that's how I'm going to do this whole sketchbook. So I'm really forcing myself into layers to learn. And what I learned here was that in order for me to get the richness to make it look three-dimensional, let me pull that up so you can see. It really does look three-dimensional with that wire, and that's because of the dark shadow underneath. Do you see that darkish line right under the wire here? And that's what creates that shadow. So I liked that a lot. But I also, I don't really wrap wire a lot or use wire a lot, but I do use embroidery floss a lot. So that got me thinking like, okay, my shape has to have embroidery floss so that I can figure out a different texture. Now that's softer. It's not as hard as wire. So how am I going to do that? I'm, I'm working on figuring that out. <laughs> and then I walked out into the yard and I have a little box here on my desk of just found treasures. Every day when I go for a walk, I come in with something, really. I do. And then I get this box will get full and then I have to go release them back into nature. <laughs> but what I have in here is a little acorn and I love the little handle on it. Do you see the handle? Isn't that kind of cool? So I knew I wanted to put that in my book. And then I have a leaf from vacation. When I went to Florida, we were shopping and I absolutely love this single leaf on a branch. I know it came home from Florida with me, but I love this and I've used it in many things. So I'm going to try to add those two things. So when I have this heart and I'm thinking about, okay, what shape do I want? I don't really have an affinity for the number four. I would do a number two, but instead I thought about what if I have a metal heart? I mean, a metal letter for my shape. And I have a lot of K's and H's and J's in my studio. So I thought, well, I could do a metal H pretty easily. So I sketched out a big H here. And then I added some embroidery floss around the edge here. And then I added my acorn here. And then I added my leaf here so that the embroidery floss is actually holding it next to the H. Now I know you're like, oh my gosh, Kelly, your brain. <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is force myself to take what I've learned and then turn it into art. It's that simple. So I'm going to do this little one with you today. And as I start, I want to share with you this beautiful masking fluid that I absolutely love. It's the easiest masking, masking fluid that I've ever worked with. And I've worked with quite a bit of them. So this is by Schminky, and it's just, I believe, just called mas yeah, Masking Fluid. See that it says Masking Fluid there? And this is a, let's see how many ounces, 25 milliliter. And I believe it's the smallest one, and this will last you forever. I've probably done 15 projects, and I haven't even squirted out hardly any. So let me show you how easy this is to apply. I'm going to bring you a little closer and hopefully hopefully it'll be in focus. What I'm going to do is the embroidery floss is what I'm going to put this on. 
Now there's a trick to this. When you are putting it on, I just put a little bit on my palette. That was way too much, by the way. And what you're going to do when you go to clean it off, just let it dry on here because it's plastic. It will pull right off just like um, just like acrylics does on ceramic. I have a really old nasty brush. Buy the cheapest brush that you can find. I believe this came in a pack of like six brushes for like three dollars or something like that. But what I liked about it is the very sharp point. See that point? Because I like really fine lines. So I'm going to get it wet and then blot it dry, keeping my point. And then I'm going to dip it into my paint here. Just the tip. But what I'm going to do is push it down here. So what that's doing is it's getting rid of that giant blob that was on the tip. Watch when I pull it up. Let's see, do you see how it's got kind of a ball on it there? I don't want that. So I'm blotting it off and I'm kind of twirling the shape so that the brush reshapes itself. Do you see how it's there, but it's not that blob of paint anymore. So then I'm gonna take it one little line at a time. Sorry, I want you to see me using this every time. I'm trying to leave space in between. I got that knot there, I want that. Got some thread hanging down. What I like about this stuff is you can get a really fine line here. It takes a little while to get used to it. And it will start to be sticky. By sticky, I mean sticky on your brush. So all you do is rinse your brush out, reshape it. Okay, now I'm gonna go And the thing about this, it works best if you let it dry. It has to dry. And your papers, your different papers, will give you different results. Just know that. So try it on a scrap piece first. Again, this journal here that I'm using has Fabriano paper in it. Okay, so let's see if you can see. Oh, you can see the shine already. So do you see that? And look how skinny it is, you guys. Look at how skinny those lines are. Like I said, this brush is amazing. Do not use your good brushes. Do not use your good brushes. <laughs> then what you're gonna do with this brush, you're gonna take it to the sink, you're gonna wash it out with, I put a little bit of dish soap in my hand and I just, wring it back and forth in there to get all of this off. If you were to leave this in your brush, it will harden and you won't be able to get it off. So always take it right to the sink and wash your brush and make sure you put soap on there. That's again why you don't want a good brush. This has to dry and then I'll be back. My masking fluid is dry. How you test it is in your thickest area, I have a thick area here, just press down on your finger. If it's still wet, a piece of it will come off, but it's nice and dry now. And you can still see the shine is there. See that? So we're gonna do that big H first, and I want to have it in this kind of grungy texture. I've got my 24 palette here. I just did a color swatching of the 24 and the and showed you a big color chart that it could make. So if you're interested in that, look on my channel. So I'm gonna start with sepia and a little bit of German greenish here. 
and a touch of orange just to give me that kind of rusty feel. Try it out on my color tester here. That looks pretty good. A little more orange, I think. All right. Oh yeah, that's a pretty color. I'm trying to be precise because this is a letter. So excuse me if I'm holding my breath. <laughs> I'm working with the back layer first because I know that it's going to be my darkest layer so I need to compare every other color to that. I'm keeping the edges wet because I do want to splash some different colors in there. I'm going to go up to the strings and then I'm going to stop. Kind of a nice dividing line so that I'm not going to have my paint interrupted by a wet line and a dry line. I'm going to take some of my Hematite Genuine that's my dark color here. I especially want it under this string here because that's going to be a nice shadow in here. I'm going to drop some down here. I'm going to splash. I will always come in and kind of touch different colors in. I like to do that. It adds a nice little bit to my work. I'm going to take some of that orange, the Quinciana. It gives me a couple bright spots. That's really wet. Look what it looks like. So see all the different textures in there? That's what I'm going for. Remember, I like texture a lot. I need to make the same kind of mix for the other side now. I want this side to be just a tad darker because I've got that leaf on that side and I want that leaf to pop out. Okay, that's good. I'm going to start, let's see, I'm going to start on this side. I need more water. Remember, I have a problem. I never put enough water down. And you see what's happening with the masking fluid here? It's kind of resisting.
which is just what you want it to do. Now I'm going to this back side. I did the back side last because it's skinnier and if I would have done it first I pro it probably would have dried out before I got to add all the colors, the different colors. And I only know that from doing layers and practicing. Okay, just like I did this side, I'm going to take a little bit of dark of the hematite and I'm going to add some color in there. I definitely want some shadow on this side, so I'm just going to drop some of that dark color there. I'm going to dot it under some of this yarn that's going across. And then I definitely want some of that orange too. Remember how I did orange at the end there? Doesn't that look neat? <laughs> kind of splash. Always adding. I always add. Now do you see what the masking fluid looks like? Let me bring you up close. See how it's resisting? And it's almost got little beads on it where the water beaded up. And look how fine of a line I was able to get with that. It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> Okay, for my acorn, I'm going to make it a little more on the green side, so let me show you that. This is my acorn now. It's kind of like a brown, but today when I was out in the yard, I found a green one, and I like this green. Can you see that it's changing to the brown? So I like that dirty green that it has, so that's what I'm going to use for the color. And Let's see. I would think that's a little bit serpentine. And the complement of green is red, so I'm going to touch a little bit of the red in there. When you use complementary colors, which are across from each other on the color wheel, they kind of gray each other out. See how it's not a bright green, but yet it still has the green cast. While it's wet, I'm going to take a little bit of the brown sepia, just to give it a little bit of shading. I like to add my shading when it's wet because what happens is when you put two colors next to one another, right, so wet on wet, what they do is they kind of bloom together, so they merge a little bit. Sometimes they even go into one another a little further like that, but it takes time. And you get a little softer edge, which is what I really like in my paintings. I like a soft edge. And you can see right here that the green is drying faster than the brown. Do you see that? So what I'm going to do is take a little bit of water and wet the green again. So this leaf up here, I want to make this more of a gold leaf. You can see that it's very much brown, which matches that. So I want it a little more autumn, so a little more on the raw sienna side. Now yellow and violet are complementary colors. 
So I'm going to show you what happens when I touch a little bit of lavender in there. Watch the color change. See how it just took the brightness right away from it. And that's what a complementary color will do. I'm going to take some pure antique or raw sienna now and just kind of blob it in there. Just water on my brush. There we go. <laughs> now the German greenish raw umber is a great color for acorn caps because they're almost that exact color. Add a little water to the top here. There we go. While it's wet, I'm going to take some of that sepia color. Because the acorns have dots or the pattern, look at the pattern on the cap here as you see this up close. See how it just kind of looks like dark and dots? That's why I always dot my acorn caps. I need to do the stem of this first. So I'm going to do that in German greenish as well. When removing your masking fluid, you can use a thing like this. It's called a rubber cement picker upper and it's got a rough texture and it kind of clings to the masking fluid. You can also use your finger but you always want to make sure that it's very very dry. So see the little beads sometimes they take a little longer to dry but nothing's coming up on my finger so they're done. So I'm just going to lightly rub it across the paper So do you see how that area is not shiny anymore? See that all the beads are gone off of it? Or these still have the beaded areas? Beaded, I mean the paint beading on there. And I always rub my fingers across it because you can feel it. It is kind of sticky. Think of a rubber band. That's kind of what it feels like. And sometimes you'll get little beads of color. See on like my kneaded eraser or my rubber cement picker upper. I always just pull those off. So I want you to see the lines. Look how fine they are. This is why I love this masking fluid. <laughs> I will have everything down below in the description box. Now you can see that I've got a little area here. I want to show you how you can clean that up. I'm using a flat brush, one with a chisel point. So I'm going to blot it here on my brush and I'm really going to shape that point. So see how skinny it looks? And what I'm going to do is come right over it 
it's kind of rocked back and forth. I've still got water on my brush and I'm going to blot it. I'm going to do that again. And blot it. See, I've got one on this side where that orange went out. I've got a little one here. You do not want to keep doing that though. You want to give your paper a little bit of a rest and then I'll come back and I'll try that one again. You can create a hole or start tearing apart the top layers of your paper if you keep doing that. Say you're doing that for six or seven times, you definitely will wreck the texture of your paper. And I don't want to do that, so I'm just going to let it rest for a while. And you can see it's pretty much off of these two. I just need to come back one more time with that. So on my H, I have a very thin dark line I want to add. And I'm going to do that with, I think, sepia. And I want to add a little bit of Artemis. I want it nice and dark. Yeah, that's gorgeous. A little bit more of Artemis. Okay, I'm going to turn it sideways here. That way I can, I pull better this way than pulling towards me. Staying kind of right on my tip of my brush. I could have done this shading before I took the mask off. Okay. <laughs> That's all I needed was that little bitty line. It gives it a little bit of an edge, which is what I wanted. While that's drying, I'm going to add a little shadow under this acorn. And I think I'm going to use German greenish raw umber. If it's too dark, you can always just blot it with your paper towel, but I think mine's pretty nice. Just barely there. I am going to come on that acorn and give it a little darker shadow, adding some sepia, I mean serpentine, and a little bit of the burnt scarlet. Let's see if that's dark enough. Pretty good. I'm going to add that same color to the cap. I'm going to add a little bit more raw sienna to my leaf. It looks kind of wimpy, like it's really washed out. And remember, it is washed out because those were the colors that I mixed. So I'm going to add just a little brighter color here. I'm looking to see if my lines are dry before I put the lines of the fabric on there or the yarn. I'm using this brush. This is a Trekal brush. Trekal. And it is a Protégé Round 7500. And it's a number six. I really love it because of the point. Look at the point of that brush. And this is probably three or four years old and I almost use this every single day. So it's really held its point. They're not that expensive, but you can only get them from Trekel. 
you can't get them from Amazon. So when I bought mine, I bought two of them <laughs> just so that I would have one in my arsenal if this one, if something happened to this. So now I'm looking at this and going, okay, what color string do I want? Do I like it? I kind of like it how it's just white like that, but I know I want some kind of color. So do I want to go with the Coastal Fog, which is a little more green? So that's Coastal Fog. Do I want to go French Gray? No, that's too dirty. Maybe Buff Titanium? Let's see what... Let's see Buff here. Okay. I'm going to come over the edge because I want it to look like it's wrapped around. And I'm basically just filling in those lines so that they're not bright white anymore. And we will deepen this. We will deepen the shadows underneath, and that's what really makes it come to life. So did you see it change from being really bright to now it's there, but it's a little duller. So I really like that dark that I put on there. So that was sepia and Artemis. Okay, what I'm going to do now is go right next to the string. And I mean right next to it, as close as I can get it, because that's going to change how it looks, because it's going to, so here is the string. I'm going to go under it, see that shadow line, watch as my hand comes closer. So the shadow line is what I want to create. See how the, the finger already has a shadow, but I want to create that darkness underneath it. This one I want to look like it's kind of flying out. So I'm going to tuck it tight here and then as it goes out I'm going to lighten it and blot it just a little bit. In between these I'm going to try to get really skinny in there. I'm going to do the top one and then I'm going to bring it up and show you here the difference and maybe you can see the difference. Okay, can you see the line on that one, how it goes across even the stem of the stick? And then look at these, how they just look like they don't have the depth that that little line underneath does.
I like that dark. I'm also going to add that right around this acorn here. So look what that did to the strings. Isn't that nice? And see what the shadow did here by pulling it down? It makes it look like this part of the string is sitting up like that. So whenever you have, you can always do that. Like I could do it here and make it pull away if I want. But I'm going to let these just kind of hang out. I don't really want to put a shadow on this outside. I just like it like that. So from this to this, <laughs> I think that's pretty good. I like the layers a lot. I could add a piece of like paper element in the background if I wanted to, but for right now I'm going to let it sit and I think I really like it like that. I don't think I want a piece of paper because right now it feels very much like me. I love nature. It's an H for Hernig and I'm adding some fun texture with the string on there. I hope this has been an interesting look into taking a magazine picture or a picture that you found, creating it, taking what you loved, and creating your own art. Happy exploring. If you were inspired by today's video, please like, comment, or subscribe. My channel would really appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching.